Amen. The Lord be still upon us, his blessing, grace, and mercy down from the age of ages. Amen. Tonight we are honored and blessed to have uh, Deacon Nina Hanna to be with us, as many of you already know him. Um, and he's also serving now currently in the Department of Education. So we're uh, honored to, to hear from, from the words of the Holy Spirit through It's nice to finally be back praying Pascha in person. We all missed uh, being able to see the icons and being inside God's house and experiencing and praying the, the events of his passion and soon his resurrection. Um, our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection are not just something that we see in movies or it's not something that we just tell our, our kids or we were told when we were younger. <laughs> um, it's not a legend, it's our life. If um, it's, not, it's not something that's just in the past, but it's something that we live today. And the church has arranged readings that force us to remember um, that it is, it is what we live. It takes us through an unforgettable journey um, every year to the glorious resurrection. Yes, tomorrow some people will see our Lord tied, mocked, spat on, whipped, nailed on the cross. And they might see it as an image of defeat or an image of weakness. But... The church sees a different image than this, that the Christ who is being judged is the true judge, that the Christ who they said is deserving of death, he's actually the one that has the authority to give life to whom he wills, in the Gospel of John. Uh, that that Christ whom we see tomorrow, whom we see giving himself up unto death for us, he's in fact the one who conquers death. Because of this, we find that the church has placed the event of raising Lazarus from the dead at the start of the Holy Pascha. To remind anyone this week that might see him um, in weakness or they might see the torment that he goes through and the, him hanging on the cross and remind them saying, don't forget, this is the same Christ that showed power over death and raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. And throughout the whole week, this is a remind, it's a reminder when we chant uh, the hymn, Tok Te Te Gom, uh, and if every church, you hear it uh, progressively getting more powerful each hour. The first hour, you hear it. Everyone is chanting it with uh, all the effort, that, every effort that they have. The third hour, stronger. Until the end, it, and that, it, it's, it's one of the most powerful hymns that we hear. Everyone knows it, everyone chants it. At the top of their lungs, really. Um, thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, and the majesty. And on Palm Sunday, we see Christ entering Jerusalem as king. And all the people were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, and this is the king of Israel. All the people, the children, everyone was proclaiming this. And that day, that same day, we read um, in the 11th hour gospel, in the day, uh, the account where the mother of the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee's sons, asking Christ to allow her sons to sit one at the left and the other at the right. Where? In his kingdom. She saw him as a king, and she saw him as an earthly king. In another account, uh, certain Greeks went up to worship for a feast, and they went to Philip asking him to see Jesus. For sure they saw or they heard the miracles that he was performing, and they wanted to see something. They wanted to see this wonder worker. They wanted to see him perform some kind of miraculous work. So Philip went to Andrew and they told Christ. Christ's response to this was, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And today, again, we 
we hear this theme of the hour. Right? What, what is this hour? Where, where else did we hear Christ refer to the hour? We think of the beginning and the first sign when he, when he was at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, when he turned the water into wine as his first miracle. And right before that, um, St. Mary Theotokos goes to him and presents the problem. And he says, my hour is not yet come. And he does this at a wedding. At the end of this account, St. John writes that Christ revealed his glory. And he did this, he revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. When you ask someone, show me your glory, or how do you think Christ should show his glory? A lot of people respond, oh, he should raise someone from the dead. Okay, if you want to show glory over death, you raise someone from the dead. If you want to show glory over the sick, you heal someone. But instead, he chose to change water into wine to sh as his first sign of glory. He's trying to remind us that he is the true bridegroom. This hour that he's referring to is the crucifixion, the hour of glorif glorification, the hour of his wedding. And this morning we celebrated with him his wedding banquet in the Divine Liturgy. And tomorrow we celebrate his wedding, the wedding where he takes his bride, us, the church, to himself. So now we have Christ as a wonder worker, Christ as just another king on earth, or Christ the bridegroom. It doesn't stop there. During the week, Christ also asked the, the disciples, asking them, who do men say that I am? So some of them said, John the Baptist. Why, why would John the Baptist be an answer? Um, the first person to say this actually was Herod. He killed John the Baptist. He started playing with his head and uh, started saying, this is this is." The risen John the Baptist, and he's coming to take revenge on me. Uh, and this began to spread. If you're a follower of Herod, you're going to hear him saying this, and you're going to start saying the same things that he's saying. Others said Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet to the Jews, and he performed a great miracle of having it stop raining for three and a half years. When After this, he, he visited the widow at Zarephath and asked her to feed him. But she told him, I only have a handful of flour and some oil. And he told her, that's okay. Make me the first cake and let me, let me eat. And she did. When she did this, he blessed and he, um, he told her that the flour and the oil will not run out. So, and Christ asked this question to the disciples right after the miracle of feeding the multitude, the five loaves and two fish. So the minds of the people jumped to Elijah since this was a similar miracle and also because Malachi they've read that Christ will come before uh, the that that Christ that Elijah will come from Christ everyone knew that he was a great man but that's not what what he was concerned about he's actually concerned about the question right after that concerned about the you part of it asking them and who do you say that I am Christ asked this to the 12 and continuously asking us, who do I see him as? Do I see him as a king here on earth? Yes. Another king? Do I see him as a wonder worker, someone that I can just pray to and ask things from, like a vending machine whenever I want? Do I see him just as another prophet? A lot of the other religions teach this. Do I see him as just a righteous man that once walked this earth? Or will I tomorrow see him as who he really is. Well, I see him as my bridegroom, my king of glory, a king that is on his throne when he is on the cross. The, the ancient church, when they, would, when they would depict the cross, they would put, put Christ on the cross alert, eyes open, strong. They saw, they saw the cross as the way to salvation. This was his throne. And... Tomorrow, God willing, when we chant the hymn, Peke Thronos, you, we, we, we hear this hymn, Your throne, O God, is forever, in the twelfth hour.
The hymn is one of the most ancient hymns in our church. And the, the tune itself actually is Pharaonic, where it is, it is the coronation of Pharaoh, where one Pharaoh would be getting buried, but another would be ascending the throne. That's why when you hear the hymn, in the beginning, it's very mournful. You get to Alleluia, and it, it turns. You don't have to have a musical ear for this. You, you can hear it. As soon as the word Alleluia begins, it's very joyful. And you'll even start seeing some of the deacons kind of jumping to it, and they get very into it. Everyone gets very into it. And this is, this is chanted when, when, when it is complete. He's on his throne. Sometimes we feel very overwhelmed throughout the week. We, we hear so many different things. Um, we, we're trying to uh, read as many books as we can. But we do what we can. Um, Christ showed this, and he, he, would he will take over when we do what we can. When he was raising Lazarus, he said that he was going to rise again. But they didn't know how. So he told them, it's okay, do what you can. You do your part. Roll, roll the stone away. You do your part, and I'll take care of the rest. So they did. And sure enough, he raised them from the dead. Throughout, throughout the week, today, tomorrow, until the resurrection, God willing, throughout the whole week and throughout the year, every day of our life, we try to take one thing and we hold on to it. We have to do this in honesty and we have to rise above what everyone else is telling us, what, what the world is telling us. Um, if we recall the story of the four friends that took the paralytic to Christ and we recall the account of Zacchaeus climbing the tree, there's one thing that is similar between those two stories. They both had to rise above the people in order to see Christ, they didn't stay with the people and whatever was happening. No, they, they had to rise above that in order to see Christ. And when they were able to rise up and see Christ, Christ saw them and was with them. Um, I, I, think, I thank God and pray that God allows us to see him as the true bridegroom, the true king of glory, and that he continues to visit us with his grace. I think. My fathers, uh, Buna David and uh, Buna Daniel, and all of you for this blessing. Glory be to God forever. We ask and entreat.